like Mr. Musk thinks? Are we living in simulation? I find it hard to argue against that possibility. Meaning? Meaning. You look at our computing power today, and you say, I have the power to program a world inside of a computer. Well, imagine in the future where you have even more power than that, and you can create characters that have, for example, free will, or their own perception of free will. So this is a world, and I program in the laws that govern that world. That world will have its own laws of physics and chemistry and biology. Now, you're a character in that world, and you think you have free will, and you say, I want to invent a computer. So you do. Hey, I want to create a world in my computer. And then that world creates a world in its computer. And then you have simulations all the way down. So now you lay out all these universes and throw a dart. Which of these universes are you most likely to hit? The original one that started it? Or the countless simulations, the daughter simulations that uh, unfolded thereafter? You're going, to hit a sim you're going to hit one of the simulations. So statistically, based on that argument, which first appeared by a, a philosopher from Oxford named Nick Bostrom back in the 1990s, right when computers were coming real enough to think this through. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to argue against the possibility that all of us are not just the creation of some kid in a parent's basement programming up a world for their own entertainment. And then every time something weird happens in the world, some disruptive leader takes charge. And I wonder if that programmer just got bored and had to stir the pot. So they throw somebody in there just, to, just to, for their own entertainment. For me, that's some of the best evidence that we live in a simulation. Because this happens every time uh, there's peace and tranquility in the world. But if it's true, what can we do about it? If like the Truman movie, or there was that, we're in that. Yeah, well, he can try to escape by going in the Truman movie to go through the barrier. Yeah. But yeah, if, you're, if you were programmed by somebody, yeah, no. There's nothing you can so do. So what difference does it make if I'm programmed by someone? I guess it's... I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I heard more about the simulation idea. Well, that's another, that's another idea, but that's... Yeah. Elon believes that. He believes that it's very possible. Like, like, well, the argument for the simulation, I think, is quite strong. You're going to want to interface with this sort of world that you've created through your social media page. Go live in the simulation. Yeah, I mean, it, in the simulation. some Ready Player One type shit that's real. That seems, we have that HTC Vive here, and I've only done it a couple times, quite honestly, because it kind of freaks me out. Sure. This could be some simulation. It could. Do you entertain that? Well, the argument for the simulation, I think, is quite strong. Because if you assume any improvements at all over time, any improvement... 1%, 0.1%, just extend the time frame, make it a thousand years, a million years. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. What would a, what, civilization, if you count it, if you're very generous, civilization is maybe seven or 8,000 years old, if you count it from the first writing. This is nothing. This is nothing. Um, so if you assume any rate of improvement at all, then games will be indistinguishable from reality. Or civilization will end. One of those two things will occur. It's possible that a simulation is one day going to be inevitable, that we're going to have something that's indistinguishable from regular reality. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to sound like, like things are too dark, because I think like you, you kind of have to be optimistic about the future. There's no point in being pessimistic. It's just too negative. It like, doesn't help. No, it doesn't help. You know, I think you want to be, I mean, my theory is like you'd rather be optimistic. I think I'd rather, I'd rather be optimistic and wrong. So, so the idea is right. Any sufficiently advanced civilization would create, could create a simulation that's like our existence. And so the theory follows that may, maybe we're in the simulation. I think here's, in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for, the, for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D 
simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. Mm -hmm. And soon we'll have virtu you know, vir virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, e even if that rate of advancement drops by a thousand from what it is right now, um, then you just say, okay, well, well let's imagine it's a 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be you know, billions of such uh, you know, computers or set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. So Tell me what's wrong with that argument. Is the answer yes? <laughs> the argument is probably. I mean, I just like is there is there a flaw in that argument? I mean, someone, but someone. I'm not sure what but, the error. In, all right, no, no, the argument makes sense. So the assumption then is that somebody beat us to it, and this is a game. No, no, there's a one in billions chance that this is base reality. Oh, okay. What do you think? Well, I think it's one in billions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this, this that seems to be. Like clearly, what the you know what the, what it, what it suggests, right. and and actually, I mean, arguably, we should hope that that's true, because otherwise, if if civilization stops advancing, then that may be due to some calamitous event that erases civilization. Many many more simulated ones than non-simulated ones will be over the course of all of history. Over the course of all yeah. of history, but what so, if it hasn't yet right. happened? But so then the question is, given that, uh, you know that by the end of time there will have been let, let's say just a, a million simulations and one original history sure um and that all of these simulated people and the original history people all have subjectively indistinguishable experiences you can't from the inside tell the difference right then what given that assumption would it be rational for you to believe should you think you're one of the exceptional ones or should you think you're one, you know, amongst the, the larger set, the simulated ones? University of Maryland professor James Gates proves we live in a computer simulation. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. Where, where has this pursuit taken you? Oh my God. Where have you landed? Why would you ask that? I'm asking you that here and now. It's New York City, it's okay. March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. <laughs> these are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers? That is correct. So the wait, wait, I'm still, wait. I have to just be silent for a minute here. So you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos? Into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code? Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code, it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. That's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory 
and in general in systems that we call, say are supersymmetric. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Time to go home, I think. I'm not, where are we going to go? Ahead? So, so are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? Well, I didn't say that. I mean, mm -hmm. some of those like the Matrix? You, that's what the, you said. Some of those codes are, are showing on the screen behind you right now. They don't look like codes, but these pictures, which we call adinkras, are graphical representations of sets of equations that are based on codes. So this is, in fact, to answer your question more directly, I have, in my life, come to a very strange place because I never expected that the movie The Matrix might be an accurate representation of the place in which I live. While Professor Gates does not openly acknowledge that we live in a simulation, it's the only conclusion that can be drawn. Computer code underlines our physical universe. Professor Gates's information is consistent with MIT professor Seth Lloyd's information. Yeah, well, so I've argued that the universe is effectively a quantum computer. In fact, not even effectively, actually is a quantum computer. Um, and actually, you know, this is something, in some sense, it shouldn't be controversial because, um, first of all, we know that the laws of physics support computation. We know this, we don't have to prove it because I actually possess a computer, right? <laughs> and then we actually also know that the laws of physics support quantum computation, so computation at the most microscopic level performed by elementary particles. And again, I don't have to prove it because I own a quantum computer, right? <laughs> and here at IQC, you have vast laboratory space chock full of quantum computers. So, um, you know, the fact that the universe at bottom is, uh, is processing information, computing in a uniquely quantum mechanical way is in some sense uncontroversial.